since medieval times, the land of the rising sun has struggled to keep those secrets that are unique to her soil. The samurai is the traditional warrior figure of Japan. His approach to life and death, to loyalty and obedience, to killing and being killed, formed a way of life that the Japanese people have followed for centuries. We're going to search beyond the familiar sights and sounds of everyday life in Japan. And what we're searching for is the remarkable legacy that the Japanese people have preserved from their samurai heroes of the past. fighting arts are known today as the way of the warrior or the way of the sword. modern facade of bright lights and traffic fumes, 20th century Tokyo still hides her warrior past. This may be the most crowded, the most busy, the most modern city in the world, but in other ways, it's also one of the oldest and most private. Still a favorite popular indulgence is the samurai film. It's been called a kind of Eastern Western. Judo is perhaps the most widely used and popular martial art in the world. Millions of people practice it. Developed only 40 years ago, Judo combines many fighting techniques in the most effective ways, combining weight, speed and balance. The founder of Judo was called Kano, and he drew his ideas from all the different fighting acts. In Judo, we aim not just for physical, but also moral strength. For the self-perfection of the warriors of old. Above all, he said, we're striving for a state where, finally, the differences between oneself and others have been transcended. The first man to write down a code of conduct for the Japanese warrior was the great fighter, poet, and artist, Miyamoto Musashi. From the metal sword of the samurai, he developed the subtler art of the wooden sword. 
Outside an ancient temple, these men are fighting with wooden swords. It's a formal style of combat. Once, these weapons were used just to train warriors to fight with real blades. But many samurai came to regard these as superior to the metal blade. One blow could shatter sword or skull. Musashi defeated every rival with his wooden sword until the day he was himself defeated by this combination of movements. Another ancient form of fighting is Naginata. Women protected themselves and their families with it. Here, technique is only half the story. What really matters is the timing, strategy, and concentration. They say, in the eyes of the fighter lies her strength. In her mind, the strategy. Her body obeys with smoothly coordinated movements. Kusari Gama means fighting with chain and sickle. way to attack a swordsman by ensnaring his sword with a chain and then hooking him from behind with a curved blade. In all these ways of fighting, you can sense the exact timing and concentration behind each move. Unspoiled landscapes may be fast disappearing. But here, as in the city, if you look hard enough, you can discover a less familiar side of daily Japanese life. The Japanese still remember their military traditions. Here, in a village near Osaka, children are being taught the way of the warrior. This training goes deep. They'll remember and practice it for the rest of their lives. Their teacher is one of the last great masters of swordplay. Practice hard so as not to shame your ancestors. Always think of the sword in your hand as a real one, with the power to spare or to kill. The disciplines of the martial arts that ruled this master's life are now passed on as his legacy to the new generation. Other fighting arts are practiced in the most unexpected places. This is the police training center in Tokyo. Notice how the Japanese have attached to these the same polite ritual as to all their other arts. This type of boxing is thought to have developed from Chinese Kung Fu.
part of their daily diet of discipline, these policemen are also taught the premier martial art of Japan, kendo. Here, wearing a modern style of armor, the police are taught all the strategy of the ancient samurai sword fighter. And it doesn't come easy. Though you might never have guessed it, this wielding of truncheons is the latest version of the sword play of the ancient samurai. It's been adapted to meet the more practical needs of today. But it isn't only men who train here. These girls are being taught how to use their bodies as weapons of combat. The Japanese must look with mixed feelings on these meter wardens of tomorrow. This is called Aikido, and it teaches the girls to overcome the wrongdoer by blending their energies with his. In this way, the weaker sex may become the stronger, they say. The principles of Aikido are thought by some to date back to the 11th century, to the earliest samurai warrior clans at Kamakura. This giant bronze Buddha now marks that spot. Aikido does have strong religious overtones. This is Master Ushiba Kishomara, widely regarded as its greatest living exponent. The master explains, in Aikido, your mind and body become one, in a way of fighting that applies force through natural rhythms. You defeat your opponent through a smooth circle of movement. <laughs> Attack and defense are really the same thing, because you use your attacker's own strength to overcome him. There's no thought of injuring or defeating your aggressor, says Master Kishomara. It's more like an elegant dance of the old days. Beside his crystal ball sits Yamaguchi Gogen with his wife. He's 10th Dan Master of Karate, of almost mythical reputation. He's also a Shinto priest. Shinto is the traditional religion of Japan. In 
my crystal ball, I conjure up spirits of past and future. I talk to the samurai warriors of old and to the fighters who are yet to come. And the secrets they tell me, I pass on through my karate school. his drum, Yamaguchi is calling up the spirits of the past. In fact, this karate school regards correct breathing as basic to everything. Here, the master practices lion breathing. It helps to concentrate energy inside his body. Millions of its followers all over the world tend to think of karate more as an aggressive than a defensive art. But not at Yamaguchi school. Here, they aim for self-protection and self-perfection, but never aggression. In Yamaguchi's words, karate is a discipline. It also means you're not to be beaten if you're attacked. Literally, karate means open hand fighting. attack and defense involve using arms and legs as incredibly efficient weapons. You can punch and kick almost every portion of the body. sorts of people for all sorts of reasons take up the fighting arts but the Japanese believe that through their martial arts they can reach ever higher standards of work pleasure and success in all things but in searching for the deeper roots of these traditions we are inexorably led away from the bustle of the modern city towards the landscapes and temples of old Japan we find here aren't just relics of a bygone age, but buildings which, behind their walls, preserve intact the ancient martial arts. This is the combat hall of the Imperial Palace of Japan. This is where the emperors used to come for centuries to watch their warriors fight. The Imperial Guard are about to take part in the foremost martial art of Japan, Kendo. It means 
way of the sword. Kendo tournaments begin with a practice warm-up. It sounds strange, but these fighters believe their bout is won before it even takes place. Like the ancient samurai, they believe that the man who has the stronger mind, the sounder tactics, the deeper understanding, has won before he ever lifts his sword. Two teams of the Imperial Guard from different districts of Japan prepare to fight. The white team is from the south, the blue from the north. Kendo is fought with bamboo swords that have developed from the original samurai weapon. Targets include the head, throat, and wrists. The kendo fighter learns to treat his opponent not as an enemy, but in the words of Miyamoto Musashi, as an honored guest. Your opponent becomes like a mirror held up to you, reflecting your own doubts and weaknesses. To overcome your opponent is to overcome your own fears. in all other martial arts, the combat is completed by ritual bowing. They say this shows respect for your opponent and respect for the combat hall that preserves the spirits of the fighters who went before you. The Japanese relate their martial arts to all of life's activities, financial, moral and social. In Kendo, as in all their other fighting arts, they still preserve the warrior spirit of their past. This is Tofakuji, one of the oldest Zen temples in Japan. Zen brought to Buddhism something uniquely Japanese, a humor and a vitality affecting everything in life. the Japanese fighting arts have Zen Buddhism at their roots. This shooting has an extraordinary, almost religious precision to it.
Mounted archery was once the pride of the samurai warrior. Still today, at weekends, city workers and students practice the same thing. With battle cries of old, astride a wooden horse. The warrior's arts were once known as the way of the bow and the horse. The way didn't just mean technique, it meant a whole approach to life. sword were weapons of the noblemen, and many devoted their whole lives to the practice of them. <laughs> Kyudo, or Japanese archery, is still practiced in the homes of the old samurai families, like Master Ogasawara. The real secret of archery lies in control of breathing. In the master's words, there's no quick and easy way about it. Learning archery means learning to accept incredible hardship and discipline. Zen teaches us that it's through breathing that we come to understand ourselves. Breath weaves our movements together into a kind of rhythmic sequence. You have to be patient to master the skills of archery. When, after four years training, a student asked me how much longer it would take, I told him, the way to this goal is not to be measured. Of what importance are weeks, months, or years? The sound of the bowstring is supposed to have the power of banishing evil spirits. Certainly enormous strength is needed to shoot these six-foot bamboo bows. The master warns his pupils. Slowly, you will find yourself becoming a different person. For archery means a profound, far-reaching contest of the archer with himself. You'll see with other eyes and measure with other measures. And it'll happen to all who are touched by the spirit of this art. The instructor is Master Ogasawara, whose ancestors in the 14th century first explained the ways of archery. It's a unique occasion when the master himself performs in the samurai costume of his forefathers. He's shooting with a ritual whistling arrow. The most important public event for the archers is their autumn festival in the town of Kamakura. From the shrine where samurai warriors prayed back in the 11th century, these holy arcs are brought down once a year and carried along the Kamakura High Street.
this symbolic procession opens the festival. But it's clear, even by this early hour, that some sections of the march have consumed more than their fair share of festive spirits. In this case, the Japanese rice wine, sake. <laughs> This whole procession is in honor of the Yabusame, the traditional horse archery festival that has been happening here each year for centuries. There's an air of nervousness and expectation all around the course. It's in the crowds, the riders, and the horses. As in ancient times, the fan of war is raised to start the contest. These mounted archers will have to shoot down targets placed only seconds apart. As they shoot their arrows, they've got no reins to guide or stop their horses. Their only control is with their knees on their horses' saddles. of war is raised one final time. The last rider must hit his target. <laughs> the real spirit of archery, like most other martial arts, is found in the practice of Zen Buddhism. Complete control of body and mind was as important in Zen as in all the fighting arts. The priests always said, Zen means to act without looking back. So Zen is the faith of the samurai warrior. Aijutsu, or sword drawing, depends on unsheathing and delivering a fatal blow. This was often done against slow or unsuspecting enemies, much like a Western gunfighter. Breathing rhythm and concentration govern every move. The samurai believed his sword wasn't just a military weapon, but also, strangely, a spiritual one. He believed its power for good was stronger than its power for destruction. This he owed to the teachings of Zen. The garden of the Zen temple is precisely laid out as a physical picture of the spiritual world. Everything here should be in harmony. But harmony inside the monastery is enforced with stern discipline by Japan's oldest living Zen priest.
but Zen priests have never been reclusives. They themselves practice most of the fighting arts, including wooden staff combat. It's strange to think that the martial arts developed inside the temple grounds. Traditional jujutsu was fought there too. Jujutsu means using your body as a weapon of combat. It was a basic part of samurai training, together with horsemanship and etiquette. <coughs> to raise funds for their temples, Buddhist priests even became professional wrestlers, sometimes known as sumo tori. This is a sumo stable near Tokyo today. The fighters live and train here. Sumo is a sport that's changed little over the centuries, and it's still the most popular in Japan. The master here is former grand champion Wakanohana, one of the greatest of all time. He rules his stable with an iron discipline. Junior wrestlers have to clean, serve, and bath their seniors. Sumo is fought in sand-covered rings that are kept spotlessly clean. Even a drop of blood can stop a fight. It's surrounded by tradition. A Shinto shrine sits above the heads of the wrestlers who worry about every detail of their appearance. These men weigh anything up to 30 stone. That's 420 pounds. This weight is mostly in their huge bellies. They need a low center of gravity for fighting, so short legs and fat stomachs are the ideal figure for the sumo man. Uniquely, the master's younger brother also fights here, champion Takonohana. He's the pin-up boy of sumo. He's 25 and makes TV commercials and pop records. Many frown on his commercialism, but at the moment he's national sumo champion of Japan. A stable's reputation and its finances depend heavily on its champions. A good grip on your opponent's belt means almost certain victory. A bout is won by flooring or shoving your opponent out of the ring. Every sumo fight is a mixture of speed, strength and psychology. And it can end just as suddenly as it began. After wrestling, the main meal is served. The seniors eat first, and the juniors take what's left. Their stew is called chanko nabe, and it's said to contain everything but the kitchen sink. Today, there's giant squid cooked with soya and sugar. Often, it's washed down with staggering amounts of beer and sake. Sumo fighters are regarded as a privileged class in Japan, and they take full advantage of the fact. In many ways, these tough men are quite pampered. 
The sumo fighters in Japan enjoyed the same kind of following as, say, pop stars in the West. <laughs> Instead of photographs, sumo fans collect the handprints of their heroes. And for the fighter, it's another way of earning a little on the side. <laughs> Everything in the sumo stable is disciplined and communal. They do their own washing and cleaning. Almost all the wrestlers sleep in dormitories, whether they're champions or novices. All their thoughts are about sumo and about the great fighters who went before them. The greatest of them all was the one-eyed champion Futabayama, who reigned unbeaten through the 1930s. He was worshipped by the whole nation. His pre-fight ritual was his self-dedication to the gods. About him, the roof is modelled on a Shinto shrine, and the ring in which he stands is the symbol of chaos. The year is 1940. Outwardly, Futabayama symbolized the strength of the Japanese nation. Only after he'd broken every record in the book was he defeated in the midst of the Second World War. In the years that led up to the war, it had been decreed that the art of sumo must be taught to all male children. Japan's schools are for the sake of the nation, not of the pupils. By World War II, the way of the warrior had become the way of nationalism and of loyalty to the emperor. These young kamikaze pilots went to sacrifice their lives in battle with the same ritual as the samurai of old. had the real warrior spirit become perverted. Post-war Japan set about rebuilding her country and her pride with extraordinary energy. But the influence of American culture brought a change towards ideas of competition and winning or losing. Today, however, millions of people from all walks of life practice some form of fighting art. And this has now spread to almost every country in the world. But it's not just to keep themselves fit that these people practice the martial arts. It's also to rediscover the real traditions of their warrior past. So there's a nostalgia about the samurai oh, heroics in their films, however fantastic they may seem to us. basement of a Tokyo office block, a kendo combat class is taking place. Kendo, the way of the sword, is the father of all the fighting arts. All these fighters are watched by their master. To him, each kendo move had a symbolic title. The Red Leaves Cut. The Mountain Sea Charge. 
the Chinese monkey's body. And each signified an attitude to life. So these fighters like to think of their kendo hall as society, and each kendo exercise as their everyday affairs. Their relationship to their master is typical of attitudes that run all through Japanese society. Deep respect and obedience to authority. Towards the close of each session, the master himself rises to demonstrate the fighting ways of the samurai warriors. He says, in doing this, I am rekindling the spirits of the past. So past and present become one in the moment of combat. At the close of each session, the fighters remove their masks. They're revealed as leading businessmen and politicians, directors of major Japanese companies. It's men like these who run Japan. They believe that the martial arts give them an understanding of psychology and tactics that helps them in all their dealings, both political and business, at home and overseas. They've learnt the way is in training. Do nothing which is of no use. Distinguish between gain and loss in everything you do. To these men, strategy in the martial arts is strategy in life. Kung Fu, Karate, Taekwondo, all the Oriental martial arts develop keenness of the mind and spirit, as well as physical strength and skill. The same goes for Kyudo, Zen archery. In of all places, New England, the Japanese master Kanjuro Shibata uses lessons in archery to teach his students lessons in life. This is Karmacholi, a center of Buddhist learning in rural Vermont. People come here from all over the country and from all walks of life to practice a variety of ancient meditative techniques. These men and women have come to learn Kyudo, the way of the bow. Hi, Yumi, left, stand up. Kanjuro Shibata is a master or sensei of Kyudo. Push, six percent. He came to the United States from Japan in 1985, Four. hoping that the Eastern Four. discipline, which is sometimes Push. called Zen archery, Four. would find a receptive audience Four. in the West. On the surface, Kyudo seems Four. to resemble the Western sport of archery. Four where points are scored each time the arrow hits the target. But for Sensei, the bullseye is unimportant. The target is one's mind.
In Kyudo, the archer confronts his inner self because the bow is so difficult to master. He learns, above all, to be patient. They say that Zen monks had to sit on a stone for 10 years before they could even start to understand anything. In Kyudo, it takes 10 years to learn how to grip the bow properly. As early as the 8th century, the Japanese nobility recognized archery as a way to develop self-discipline. Later, when Japan was convulsed by a series of civil wars, an emerging warrior class known as samurai regarded the bow as a superior fighting tool. Using it correctly became an art. After the teachings of Zen Buddhism reached Japan, the martial arts gradually took on a new emphasis. The Zen warrior's primary goal was to purify heart and mind and thus become fearless in battle. Sensei is 20th generation samurai. For the past century, his family has held the title of official bowmaker and archer for the Emperor of Japan. In his Kyoto workshop, Sensei forms the bows, or yumis, from a series of bamboo and hardwood laminates, sometimes using wood cut by his great-great-grandfather. The bows are between six and seven feet long and can take up to 10 years to make. According to samurai tradition, bows crafted by masters like Sensei contain the spirit and consciousness, the essence of their creator. The yumi is not only something used to throw an arrow, it is a tool to cleanse one's mind. The yumi itself is the teacher. According to an ancient Zen saying, a man discovers his true character at the moment of the arrow's release. Every movement in Kyudo is a meditation. He who masters the bow, masters himself. In China, in the old days, the emperor tested people by having them shoot the bow. It was a way of measuring a man's personality, his state of mind. If he used the bow properly, if the owl was released with dignity, he could be trusted. The essence of Kyudo is balance inner and outer. Balance is achieved by mastering the seven coordinations of Kyudo, from the initial stance to the final pause after the arrow is released. These are beginners using the bow for the first time. Push, pull, push, pull. Kai. <laughs> For Sensei, there are no mistakes. At this stage, reflection on technique is the most important thing. Body, shoulder, cross. Yumi, yeah, cross. The legs are planted firmly like a tree rooted solidly in the earth. Grip, eh? 
The upper torso feels uplifted, as if attached to a string in the sky. Fast push. Big watch. Big watch. Big watch. Stop. Have a Okay, Hendrik. When the arrow is finally released, it is not the result of a conscious decision. But when the moment is ripe, like a piece of fruit falling naturally to the ground. One of Kudo's most difficult concepts for Westerners is the relative unimportance of the target. Sensei's students start by shooting at a bale of hay a single bow length away. Then, usually within three months, they take aim at more distant targets. following instructions similar to those transmitted to samurai warriors centuries ago. For me, I think uh, the mind that Kudo develops is one of uh, awareness and present moment. You can be in a very confusing situation and not be carried away by all that and able to see what's going on and be appropriate in the situation. I'm a poor. My mind is always working. It's always thinking. It's always thinking about things that happened before and hoping they'll happen again, or worrying about things that are going to happen in the future. And that's very confusing. We, we try to be, oh, I try to be on the spot. When you're doing kudo, you've got this enormously impossible form. Your hands, every particular movement that you do with your hands, your body, your eyes, are prescribed. When, uh, and yet you, we still, there are things that are going on in your mind. I'm balancing my checkbook, you know. I'm standing up there and reliving an argument I just had. I'm, I'm furiously angry. I'm worried about money. It's difficult to let go of those. And all of a sudden you get up there and you're at balance and you're thinking and you're thinking and you're still thinking and then you let go. But that release is so powerful, it's so strong, it's so physical with your yell that it just snaps you back to, I'm here, and all that stuff is meaningless. Finish. to treat oneself with discipline and others with kindness. It comes from inside after long practice with the bow. Kudo starts with spirit and ends with spirit. A master does not try to hit the target. He does not even hope to do that. But if he has a good heart, if his spirit is correct, he will hit the target, even if he is blind.
National Geographic Explorer will return after this.